Hey everyone, we're going to give it a couple of minutes and then we'll go ahead and get started as folks log on. Hello, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. And if folks join us late, that's totally okay. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the Concept to Completion Screenwriting Workshop with George Nicholas. I'm Stephanie Toole, and I'm the Education and Outreach Manager here at the Maslin Museum. I'm pleased to welcome you tonight. We are thrilled to offer this program in conjunction with the 2023 NEA Big Read in Maslin, through which we're celebrating Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu. NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. For a complete listing of in-person and online Big Read events in Maslin, Stark County, and beyond, you can visit www.maslinmuseum.org slash bigread. Before we begin, I will share the museum's land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects the history and presence of indigenous peoples and their enduring relationship to their traditional homelands since time immemorial. The Maslin Museum recognizes that this is the traditional homeland of the Lenape Delaware, Shawnee, Wyandotte, Miami, Ottawa, Seneca Cayuga, Chippewa, Potawatomi, and tribes now comprising the Peoria tribe. We acknowledge these peoples, their elders, past, present, and future, and the thousands of Native people who now call Northeast Ohio home. Learn more at masslandmuseum.org slash land acknowledgement. Museum staff will be monitoring the chat during the program. If you have any technical difficulties, please message me for assistance. I'll do my best to help you out. Uh, there will be time for questions during the last 15 minutes or so of the program. You can submit those questions using the Q&A feature. If for whatever reason that's not showing up for you, feel free to input those into the chat as well, and I'll gather them to ask George. And now I will turn the program over to Mass News Executive Director, Alexandra Nicholas Kuhn, who will introduce George. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It is such a pleasure to be with everyone this evening and to welcome George Nicholas to give this workshop for us. Um, we are recording the session, I believe that Stephanie said, so if anyone misses it or has um, some has some technical difficulties, we can make sure we get you the recording. But um, as Stephanie said, I'm the executive director of the Maslin Museum. Maslin Museum is located in the heart of downtown Maslin. It is a cultural hub where art and history come together. And it has, since its inception, offered free admission. So we hope that you will check out not only this, but other big read programs and all the museum has to offer in terms of its vast array of exhibitions programming, and other events, we'd love to see you at the Maslin Museum. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our workshop presenter this evening. Um, in addition to being our esteemed 
lecturer and um, his many talents and his lengthy resume and experience, he is also my brother. And I have had the benefit for many years of reading scripts that he has written in their various stages and offering feedback. He's been very, very gracious and made himself vulnerable in that way, but also just been so generous with sharing his, his talents and his creativity with me to discuss with him. So that has been just a treat over the years to know him in that capacity as a screenwriter as well. George was named one of Variety's Hollywood's new leaders. He is a New York-based screenwriter. He currently heads publicity for Magnolia Pictures based out of the New York office. He has written more than 15 feature length screenplays, many of which have won top honors, including from the Nickel Fellowships in screenwriting. He's optioned two feature screen screenplays, excuse me. He's been paid to write two others and rewrite one, and he is represented by Zero Gravity Management. So I am going to now welcome George to the webinar, and I'll let him take it away. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks, Alex. Thanks, Stephanie. I uh, appreciate uh, appreciate the, the introduction, and yeah, thanks for thanks for spending an hour listening listening to me talk. Um, Basically, you know, I know everybody has their own way and method of, of writing a, a script. Um, you know, there are a million different sort of screenwriting gurus out there who do it a number of ways. Um, the way I learned how to do it, it's not my own method or anything, um, but it's it's one that a lot of people use, and I can walk you walk you through that in a little bit. So I figured what we could do in this hour that we have is just kind of, I could, I could walk you through, you know, you come up with an awesome idea for, that you think you could make an awesome movie, but how do you turn that into like a two sentence log line that can get people excited to read your eventual script? And then how do you turn that log line uh, into, you know, an outline that could be anywhere from 15 to 25 pages. And that outline is your roadmap than to, you know, going and writing the script it, itself. Um, so I figured, um, you know, today, uh, rather than just kind of, you know, rattle on, I, I figured, you know, maybe most people have heard of Back to the Future, uh, or maybe most people have seen it. Um, so I figured I could just kind of walk you through um, what the outline to Back to the Future looks like. Um, but even before we start there, so, you know, all great movies start with the kernel of an idea. Like I was saying a couple of minutes ago, you know, what if I could go back in time and change the past in order to save my future? Um, but how do you turn that idea into back to the future, right? So you need to ask what the genre is in the case of back to the future. It's sci-fi, time travel movie. Um, who's your protagonist? In, in the case of that film, it's a teenager who's stuck in life, Marty McFly. Uh, and what the story's going to be you know it's not just about time travel it's he gets stuck in the past and has to find uh how to get back to the to the present and save his family basically um and you have to get that story and that concept across in like one or two sentences which is uh it's not it's not super easy um and look i think you know log lines could be a master class in and of themselves um so since we only have an hour i'm gonna you know walk you through the outline process but um for anybody who's not seen Back to the Future, the log line for that would look like, you know, after a teenager is accidentally transported 30 years into the past, he must find a way to both return to his own time and reunite his parents before he and his future cease to exist. Um, so now you have your log line, but how do you turn that into an outline? Uh, so this this is a format, and I think, I'm not sure if it was emailed around, I think it, I think it might've been, uh, which is just kind of a bare bones outline slash beat sheet. Um, and uh, this is the format I like and I use for all my scripts. It's 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 this guy, Blake Snyder, um, who a long time ago wrote this book called Save the Cat. And it's it's a really digestible, easy to understand way to um, understand like what goes into writing a film and putting an outline together. Um, you know, like I was saying earlier, a lot, a lot of the time, um, this can kind of 
you know, feel like math and like, you know, equations and really, really complicated. But um, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's helped me um, just understand how to, how to do it. Um, it's a pretty solid three act structure. Um, you know, if, if anybody's interested in, in learning more about that, you can, you can find the book anywhere online, save the cat. And I think there's even like a, a sequel book. Um, but, uh, yeah, it goes way more in depth, you know? Um, so anyway, I, you probably heard stories too, where some writers can just, you have an idea for a script and you just go right into writing the script without a roadmap, you know, without a guideline. I, I'm sure that works for some people, but I don't, I don't know how to do that. I feel like I need a pretty detailed, um, outline to, to know where, where I'm going. So that I'm not just like staring at a blank page, um, you know, for, for hours on end. Um, anyway, so, um, like I was saying, I think most people have this outline. Um, I'm sure a lot of those headlines that are there in red are like, what is this? Um, so the setup, this is basically, um, this is the beginning. This is where you introduce your character and the world they live in. Um, who, who are they? What's, what's their job? It's basically a before snapshot of who your protagonist is before your story begins uh, and offers a chance to state your theme too, aka what your movie is really about. Like, what are you trying to say? Um, so in Back to the Future, the setup is where you meet Marty McFly, his troubled family, his situation, his girlfriend, uh, how the principal at his high school calls him a slacker, and he'll never amount to anything. Uh, you know, we learn that Marty is stuck in his life. He's unable to change it. Uh, and you also get the theme. Um, Marty feels defeated, um, you know, and it just, he can't, he can't change things. Um, so basically you have 10 pages to set this up and it could be anywhere between like five to six scenes, six to seven scenes, but, you know, typically you're supposed to stay, you know, in, stay within 10 pages for, for that part of it. Um, the catalyst which happens anywhere from, you know, between pages 10 and, uh, and 12. This is, you know, a life-changing event for your character. And it's also called an inciting incident. Um, and it disrupts your character's entire worldview and forces them to examine their position. This is where you get the phone call, literally, that can change a person's life. Um, and Back to the Future, it's where Doc Brown calls Marty and tells him that he has, uh, he's made some breakthroughs and asks him to meet him at Twin Pines Mall. Um, this, the catalyst is only a couple pages. It could be one page. Um, but you know, if you follow this, save the cat method, it usually happens on, on page 12. Um, and by the way, I probably should have said this at the beginning. This is assuming that, um, you know, you're writing a 110 page script. I think, you know, in Hollywood, uh, or just in the industry in general, like a lot of executives and people just don't, um, they don't have a lot of time. You know, they, they, they have a stack of scripts that you have to read every day, every week. Um, and so, you know, if they, if they crack open a screenplay and it's like 150 pages, they're going to, their eyes are going to gloss over and that script is going to go to the bottom of the pile or it might not even get read. So anyway, having an outline like this and hitting the page count is a pretty good way to make sure you're going to hit 110 um, pages more, more or less, but shouldn't be longer than 110 pages. Um so the next section is the, the debate. Um, and that's kind of the next longest chunk. Uh, the debate is, is usually an internal, an internal one, an internal debate where the character kind of wonders, where should I go? What should I do next? Sometimes the scene includes a friend with good advice that is, that is resisted by the protagonist. Um, the debate's usually triggered by a threatening or looming event. Uh, often the purpose of this beat is to show the protagonist's reluctance to change and have things as and have things stay as they as they were in back to the future it's when marty arrives at the mall in the parking lot doc brown claims to invent in time travel um but then you know you're wondering is it is it possible that's the internal debate uh doc succeeds in the experiment explains to marty how he achieved this using the flux capacitor in plutonium um doc is just about to travel into the future when some bad guys show up and start shooting at them um so Marty gets in the DeLorean, drives, hits a certain speed, and ends up back into the, ends up traveling back in, in time. Um, so, you know, that's a pretty long sequence if you've seen the movie. Um, so, you know, that's probably like 10, 10 or so pages. 
Um, once you get through that, that should bring you to, um, you know, where you're going to break into act two, um, which is also called the first act turn. It's where something kind of happens and the world turns upside down. Um, but it's also the point where the protagonist must rise to meet a challenge or there could be a big catastrophe. Uh, you know, alternate, alternatively, the main character might be inspired to make a change to reach a personal goal, even though the situation is fraught with obstacles. Um, but and typically this new goal uh, is pursued throughout the first half of, of Act uh, Act Two. Um, in Back to the Future, it's where Marty goes into town when he's in the past. He finds himself in 1955, Hill Valley. Uh, and this is sort of the upside down or antithesis world, um, an upside down version of the life he knows. Um, but here he has the possibility to change his own future in the past. Um, that should take you, that's about five pages, and then you should you should be at the B story um, by page 30. And you, what that is, is um, during the, the first half of, of Act Two, the main character usually meets a helper uh, on their journey. This character can be, it can be a love interest, a rival, a new friend, a guru. Um, all, the ultimate purpose of this new character is to assist the hero uh, on, their, on their life journey. Um, so B story and back to the future, it centers on Marty's relationship with his parents, uh, you know, his, his young parents and furthermore, his, his parents relationship with each other, but also, um, he meets a younger version of Doc Brown, um, and Doc Brown kind of acts as his helper through this, through this section, kind of acclimating him to this new world in the past. Um, the next section is kind of a, a Funny name, fun and games, which you can also call Act Two A, uh, and this is this is a long sequence of several scenes that basically show how the main character's second act works differently from the one he introduced from the one uh, introduced in the first act. Um, it's basically the promise of the premise um, that may have been described in the back of the book jacket or the tagline of the movie or even like the trailer. You know, this is like the fun and games section, which is the first part of Act Two is basically like what, why you came to see this movie, you know, all those cool trailer moments. Um, and back to the future, uh, you know, Marty explores the past, he explores 1955. Um, you know, he meets a teenage version of his father, George McFly. Um, you know, the dynamics of 1955 are obviously um, a little bit different. He meets Biff Tannen um, and, uh, you know, he's a, a big bully, he bullies his father. Um, and George, um, sorry, in, in the original timeline, um, his parents met a certain way. And so basically Marty kind of learns that like everything he does in the past affects the, the, the future. Um, so that takes you up to the midpoint pretty much. And the midpoint is exactly what it sounds like. It's the middle of your story. Um, and if you look at your script, like it's two, two halves, um, the midpoint usually, you know, they tell you to like, you're supposed to like raise the stakes, like something major happens that, you know, totally kind of can change the course of the story and the characters. Um, and usually um, it's the, the point in the story's narrative where the hero encounters either a false victory or a false defeat. A false victory is when the lead character thinks that they are getting everything that they want. But something reveals that this may not necessarily be true. Uh, it could be that this, the victory leads to even more unhappiness or trouble. Um, often the reveal at the midpoint shows that you know, what we think we want is not, not the best for, for us. The false defeat, on the other hand, uh, it's a moment that somehow resonates with failure. The character hits some sort of rock bottom uh, and from the perspective of the protagonist, there's nowhere to go but up. So in this type of story arc, the main character must, must conquer conquer himself, his fears in some way, and often it propels the midpoint into uh, a counter narrative that has a happy ending. So depending on what kind of script you're writing, um, you could have, you know, you might employ a false victory, a false defeat. It depends on, on, on the story. Um, so here, the midpoint is, you know, Doc notes that the only way to generate enough power to get back to the, the future, back to Marty's present, is through, to generate enough power, to create a bolt of lightning, um, which is un un unpredictable. So the false victory occurs as Marty remembers the flyer about the clock tower lightning strike, 
um, with the knowledge that he has of that, they can send him forward in time. And so the stakes are raised as a time clock appears. Um, Doc tells Marty that he must not go anywhere or do anything for the following week. Doing so could could have serious repercussions um, on the future and prevent him from going from going back. Um, the next section is bad guys close in, which also can be called Act Two B, um, and that's about 20, 20 ish pages, give or take. Um, and this is where you know the bad guys close in on the protagonist leading to um, you know, catastrophic conclusion, whatever that may be. Uh, these are sometimes these are sometimes characters that, that gang up on the protagonist or villains that send the story arc into a downward spiral. Um, sometimes they're internal bad guys, uh, sabotaging a lead character from making the right decisions. At this point in the story, it may be too late for the character to do what is right. Just depends. Um, this is, uh, and at this, at this point, Marty's already changed his, his future interfering in the way his parents first met. Uh, and he kind of first realizes that his brother starts to disappear from the family photo. Um, and that he has to, he realizes that he has to find a way to get his parents back together before he and his whole family basically cease to, um, cease to exist. The all is lost moment. This is the part in the movie where where something dies. It can be like literally, it can be metaphorically, um, and uh, you know it usually it usually merges seamlessly into the next section, which is the dark night of the soul. Um, the all is lost moment in Back to the Future is where Biff gets into the car with Lorraine, with Marty's mom, uh, as his cronies lock Marty in the trunk. The the sort of like whiff of death, uh, as it's sometimes called, is in the air. Is, as George McFly opens the car door, surprised that Biff is, is there inside. Um, Biff threatens him, telling him to go away, although Lorraine begs George for, for help. Marty's rescued from the trunk, but he's too late to stop Biff from what he's going to do. Um, the Dark Knight of the Soul, which I was just mentioning, it's a reflective beat that shows how the main character has changed throughout the story. Uh, often there's an element of transcending the old self to become something new or someone new. It's this is a, a scene or a sequence that it's a realization of the theme um, and shows how the main character may have learned his or her um, lesson. Um, here in Back to the Future is where George finds the courage to confront uh, to confront Biff. He saves Elaine, um, his future wife. Um, and uh, that's sort of like, you know, that moment, which I'm sure you've all seen, um, is the kind of like spark that ignites uh, his parents to um, to get to get together. <clears throat> the break into act three usually occurs on page 85. Here the protagonist experiences some kind of, of epiphany, like light bulb idea, uh, where they finally realize what it is that they have to do to fix the their problematic situation. They're reborn as a more improved version of themselves. In some story arcs, the protagonists might realize their flaws, uh, but it may be too late setting the audience up for a, a tragic ending. Um, so here in Back to the Future, with his future now saved, Marty says goodbye to his parents and goes to meet Doc at the clock tower. Um, Marty had written a note previously. Doc finds it and tears it up. And this is Marty's synthesis world, one in which he has embraced the possibility of changing his fate and has actively done so. Um, and that kind of catapults you into act three um, in the finale, in the final image. So in the finale, the hero's world is, is transformed and happier stories, bad guys are destroyed, uh, people reunited and all is not lost after all. Um, and sadder story arcs, the demons, uh, the demons within and the character meet the worst, uh, meets the worst possible and often most ironic um, fate. This is where uh, in Back to the Future, Marty races to the DeLorean. Oops, sorry, he races to the DeLorean, um, but a high, a high tower surprise occurs. The tree falls on the electric cable um, and it disconnects it from the clock tower. So to make matters worse, the DeLorean won't start. Now embracing the theme and realizing realizing that anything is possible, Marty digs deep down and decides to go against Doc's wishes. 
uh, setting the DeLorean to go back a few minutes earlier in 1985 so that he can rescue Doc. Um, Doc is able to reconnect the cables and as lightning strikes the, the clock tower, Mark Marty hits 88 uh, miles an hour in the DeLorean um, and is able to uh, um, go back to the future. Um, when Marty makes it back to the future, his, his present, he's uh, surprised to find Doc alive. Um, he'd saved the scraps of notes and read it. Um, so basically Marty's actions in the past, tearing up the letter, all that, were, you know, enabled Doc Brown to kind of get a heads up that that whole parking lot battle from the beginning was going to happen. And um, he lived. So um, as Doc um, arrives from the future, he takes Marty and Jennifer away in the DeLorean to a place where they don't need roads. Um, and, you know, maybe you've seen Back to the Future 2 in 3, but that's that's sort of it. Basically, the um, the final image is supposed to be a mirror image of the first scene in the film and kind of show some kind of change within the the character. Um, <clears throat> and that's uh, that's sort of that's sort of the outline. Um, I know uh, uh, Alex, I think you were gonna potentially show um, what uh, you know that that book so you can kind of get a sense of what a screenplay actually looks like. Um, the writing a script, the script itself, the mechanics of it's a little bit different, but you can kind of see it's sort of, you know, the headlines, prose, and, and uh, you know, character names and, and dialogue. Um, but that's kind of what it could look like. But like I said, that's, that's kind of a whole, um, a whole other, whole other class. And if you, if you're curious, I know I kind of went through that a little fast, but if you're, you know, if you want to know more or see what the script to Back to the Future looked like, it's online. You can you can find many versions of it too and and follow along. Um, but like I said, that that beat sheet that I put together is just it's one way to do it. But it's helped me um, really kind of like stay organized and um, keep to a certain page count and um, really kind of you know hone in on your characters and the world and making sure you're hitting all the beats and, and notes where um, you're supposed to. Um, probably have, we probably have probably a lot more time than I thought we would for, for questions. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm happy to go through um, the outline if anybody has questions about a specific beat or headline there or just in general. Um, I'm happy to uh, happy to to answer in the time we have left. Thanks, George, and everyone. Feel free to go ahead and enter your questions now in the Q and A function or in the chat. Um, firstly, I'm wondering what is meant by a beat. A beat is sort of um, you know uh, outline beat sheet. It's, it's sort of like an emotion or something that you're supposed to hit in a 110 page um, screenplay, you know, like you hit this beat on page 10, you hit this beat on page whatever. It's just, it's also like, you know, you could be interchangeable for um, this headline or anything else. Thanks. Um, Emily has asked, are there any tips you have for creating emotional moments and storylines? Yeah, I mean, I think that people say, I mean, sort of the, the you have to create really strong character. And I think everything kind of like stems from there. You know, like if you can craft and it's hard. I mean, I don't even, I'm not even able to do it all the time. If you can create a really compelling character that, is deep and well-rounded and that you can relate to and sympathize with. Um, I feel like having a really honest character like that, that people can see themselves in, um, will kind of help you organically create those emotional moments. Um, I don't think it's just done by dialogue. I think it's just, you know, if you can craft a really well-rounded character that, that um, um, you'll be off to a really good start.
Thank you. Another question we have is how will I know when my script is ready? I mean, is sometimes feels like it's never it's never ready. I mean, so you have this outline, right? And then you go to your first draft and and um basically what this what this outline will help you do is really cut down on the amount of drafts that you have to to write um before you get to sort of like your final draft. I mean, I think that um sometimes, you know, industry slang, you know, the first draft is called like the vomit draft, you know, which is basically like you finish it, you wouldn't show it to anybody. Yeah, <laughs> but maybe uh, you know, but that I think if you follow this um this outline, I find that I've been able to come up with a pretty solid first draft. Um, but it's tough, you know. I mean, like you can you could go through you know, maybe you nail it, you nail your, your script in like two drafts, three drafts. I've, I've written some that, you know, I've written like 25 drafts and not all of those are like page one rewrite kind of thing. It might be like, you know, changing the, like changing five or six pages within the script, but that's a, a new draft, you know? Um, and sometimes even by then, um, it wasn't like the best it probably could be, you know? So, I think sometimes you you know when it's ready if you're happy with it and if you can read it from start to finish and your script really kind of like moves you know and you're really like oh hey you know that was a pretty swift read and I was interested and you know and I was engaged and it didn't feel like a slog you know like while I was reading it if I wasn't bored um I think that uh you know those are ways you can you can kind of tell get friends to read it too you know um not your mom um probably not your sister either. I think if you, if, if you, if you want, um, you know, it's like really unbiased, um, opinion, I think it can be, uh, helpful to have, you know, friends who, who, uh, hold nothing back. Read your script. Thanks, George. Question from Alma outline first or dialogue. Outline. Um, and so, you know, sometimes when you're putting your outline together, it's like, you're not really going to like show your outline to anybody, you know, the outline doesn't have to be the thing that sells your script. You know, I think I, I sort of like when I'm doing the outline, I'll put like little ideas, um, in there, you know, like if I'm breaking out scenes in the outline, um, if I have like a really interesting, if I have like, oh, this is a good idea for dialogue that I'll incorporate into the eventual script, I'll, um, I'll just make a little note within the the outline um, so that, you know, when someone writes the script, it's, it's right there. But, but yeah, I think that the outline first, you know, I mean, I think if, like I was saying, if you create a really compelling character that you can kind of, you know, connect with and relate to whatever their struggle might be and whatever goals they have to get through to get through the script. Um, I think that really, really helps with, with dialogue. Cause otherwise if you kind of, have a half formed character that you don't really understand and you're not really like connecting to um it's it's tough to write dialogue that comes across as honest i find so character outline dialogue great the questions are starting to flow in now so here's another one what are the industry tools that help you write? What tools should we be familiar with and utilize? Uh, that's a really, it's a really good question. I think that, you know, if you read the, if you're familiar with like the trade publications in the film industry, like the Hollywood Reporter, Variety, Deadline, um, that's a really good place to start because you see the kind of movies that and scripts that people are buying. Um, and a lot of times they'll, you know, if it's like, so-and-so bought this original idea from a writer you sometimes they'll have the log line there too so you can kind of just see what kind of ideas are selling and what industry and studios and buyers are are looking for i think that's a really good a really good tool um just to kind of have you know your uh, just a better sense of what's what's happening out there and who your audience is and what's selling but also i think just reading scripts like from movies that you like is like super helpful um or i don't know if you've heard of the blacklist which is sort of like a a ranking of the best unproduced scripts every every year um and it, it's super easy to get your hands on those if you just google blacklist scripts somebody will put them up on a google drive or something 
And I think, you know, reading, reading those really, especially by like, you know, they're not movies yet. So you don't have that visual. It gives you a good, a good idea of what sort of the industry standard is and the kind of things that, you know, managers, agents, and, and studios are, are getting excited about. And I think also, um, there are websites out there too by people who you know they'll they'll basically review unproduced scripts or even produce scripts and they really break them down into like you know specific categories like you know here's why the log line for this wasn't great you know um here's why this character wasn't fully developed um but yeah if you can find sites and like there's a blacklist website too and there's this one called Script Shadow, which I like. I know a lot of people in the industry probably don't, but that um, the guy who runs that site breaks down um, breaks down screenplays, um, you know, that have just sold some of the blacklist screenplays, unproduced scripts, um, things like that. Yeah. Awesome! I hadn't heard of the blacklist before, so I'm gonna have to check that out. Cool. Yeah. All right, here's another question from an attendee. Do you have any tips if you have a great incident and you can see the first 15-ish minutes or so of your script very clearly, but then you have no idea what will happen next? It happens to me all the time. Um, I, I was just trying to write something new the end of last year and I had the log line, I had the concept and it was like, um, it was basically, I write a lot of like genre scripts, like, you know, like Supernatural, thriller kind of stuff. And, um, I was writing this, like, I was trying to write a contained thriller, um, with, with witches, which sounds kind of, kind of goofy, but I had a really cool take on it and I had a log line and I, the, the first like 15 pages, you know, through the inciting incident came together like really easily. And then I was like, oh man, like what's the rest of the script going to be like, you know, I have no idea. So it's tough. I think, you know, you have, and so maybe it wasn't it just wasn't the best idea to begin with, you know? So I think that sometimes, um, you know, if you can, if you can bust out an outline and get through the whole thing, like really, really easily kind of using these, these, these beats and these moments, um, then I think, you know, you have, you, you know, you're onto something, um, something unique, you know, and that it's a good idea that can sustain itself um for 110 page screenplay or 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 film it's and the hardest part too is you know if some of you are writers already or have written a script or if you haven't act two is always the hardest part you know because it's long it's like it can be like 50 pages you know and that's why i think that um having these th this outline and these these beats so you know where you're supposed to hit these sort of like you know these events that that happen in these turns um it helps you get through it yeah but yeah it's it, it happens all the time getting through the first 15 pages um and then you can't figure out the rest it uh it's tough but it happens to everybody thank you yes i think we all are familiar with the writer's block regardless of field <laughs> And we have a question in the chat here. Did you work alone or do you work with a director, a writing coach, or anyone else? Uh, I work alone. I know a lot of people, um, a lot of people have writing partners. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's it's not like I'm against it or anything. I just I feel like I like the process of just sitting down on my own, you know, thinking about an idea and then who the character is going to be for that idea and the story and then the script. And I can kind of do it on my own time without somebody pressuring me. Um, but a lot of people um, who I think are writing partners, I think maybe sometimes they, one of them is like really great at dialogue. Um, and then one of them is like really great at like prose, you know, writing everything, writing everything else. Um, but, but yeah, I work, I work alone, but um, you know, there's a point, in the process where you know i've finished a script and then you have to show it to if you want if you want something to happen with it i usually will show it to i have a couple like friends in the industry who will like read stuff and i'll do that sometimes before i send it to my manager because you know it can take a while to hear back from your manager sometimes but usually um you know the manager will like vet will vet the script and give you a ton of notes 
uh, and getting through nodes is its own whole process. Um, but, um, but yeah, and then, you know, let's say then a manager really likes the script and takes it to a producer who works at a, you know, major production company or something. If that producer likes it enough to option it or buy it, and you're staying on as the writer at that point, then there'll be a producer on and that producer will have notes. And um, so it's a very collaborative process like that. But the way I work, usually I, I, I write by myself um, until I get to the point where it's ready to share it with somebody for, um, you know, feedback. Thank you. And this question is connected to um, the feedback you, you were just talking about. How would you approach giving feedback on someone's script? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, if it's a friend, you know, you're going to, you're going to naturally, you're not going to want to hurt that person's feelings if it's not, if it's not good, you know, um, or if it's just not hitting, if it's not, if it's not you know, landing the way that the writer intended it to, to land. Um, so, you know, I think that it's important to be honest, but you don't have to, that doesn't mean you have to be like a jerk about it. You know, I mean, I think some readers like, you know, those readers, readers in the industry that, you know, you'll submit a script, you'll get coverage back and that reader, you know, I don't know, sometimes, you know, it's, ha it's happened to me where they just like tear your script apart and it's like, oh man, maybe this is just a horrible idea and you just don't want to even continue writing that script. So I think there's a balance you need to strike of like being being honest of what's what's working what's not like how you felt at a certain moment um and you know yeah i think uh, being being honest but not being a jerk is uh, a good a good way to go sound advice <laughs> um and we have two questions here that are kind of connected so i'm going to just ask them together uh, could you share firstly about how producers, studios, and production companies work? Who do agents and managers reach out to when they're shopping for scripts for their clients? Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of connected to that, do you have any networking tips? Um, yeah, so I'll the um I'll start with with the agents and managers and producer question, and hopefully, hopefully I I think I got I think I got that. But yeah, so age so. For anybody who's unfamiliar, sorry for people who who know all this already, but um, so a manager usually is kind of more like a like a coach um, for a writer, you know, and there's that person who will read draft after draft of a script until it gets to the perfect point where that manager then is comfortable sending it out. Um, sometimes, like you know, the manager might want to bring on an agent, you know, um, if you let's say I, I don't have an agent, but let's say I had an agent. Um, my manager would probably partner up with the agent and a lot of times what, what people are doing now, because like scripts on their own naked, as they call them, if it's just the script alone, um, it can be difficult to sell unless it's just like a totally amazing original concept. So by partnering with an agent, that agent represents actors and actresses, um, and directors, so sometimes having that agent attach one of their clients to the script um, and then they can take, they can kind of collectively take that script package now out to, that has an actor attached to it and maybe even a director, they can take that out to potential buyers like, you know, studios or producers who maybe have a deal with a studio. Um, that's how that kind of, how that kind of uh, works. Um, hopefully I answered that part of the question, but the networking question too is there are like, there's like writers groups out there. Um, there's actually this one, this one that I, um, I, you know, during the pandemic, I'm sure a lot of people probably felt that way. You know, you kind of like weren't getting out and networking in person as much seeing people. Uh, so uh, there is this um, screenwriting group and you uh, lead Jessup, um, J E S S U P um google it she, she's really great and there's like um uh, a writer's group i mean you have to you pay like a monthly fee to be a part of it but it's totally worth it and she's like really well connected and um it's basically like a a, a bi-weekly session where you all show up on zoom all the writers who are part of it and you kind of talk industry shop um and a lot of writers all the writers there are kind of in different stages of their careers some of them you know started you know 
in her writing group. And then like, they've gone on to like, you know, sell scripts or write on TV shows. Um, so that's, that's one way. I think, um, um, if you work, if you happen to have a job in the industry, you know, you don't have to be a writer, but like, if, if you're like an assistant to a producer, if you can find a job like that, some kind of job where you're just around the industry, that's how I got started. You know, I, um, I just found a job at publicity, it was independent studio a long time ago and, and never intended to want to do that full time for a long time. But, um, uh, you know, it was a way to get your foot in the door and kind of have an, uh, you meet filmmakers and actors and producers and managers and agents and stuff. So I think getting a job in the industry, um, is helpful too. I know that's tricky for people who don't live in New York or LA. Um, but writers groups, I think are a good way too, because a lot of them meet virtually and the writers are just based all over the country. Um, so, um, yep. Hopefully that, that answered everything. Thank you. We have a couple of questions now about log line. So firstly, the STC method says a log line should be two sentences. And on blacklist, it looks like log lines are one sentence. What mm -hmm. is usually preferred method in the industry? And then someone followed up and asked, what is your preferred method? Uh, I mean, that's, you know, one to two sentences, I think, is the sweet spot. I mean, it's not like one sentence or bust or two sentences, nothing less. It's It's sort of a happy medium. I think it's just all about what you need to convey, you know, in as short, as few words as, as possible. Um, you know, I've had log lines that have, have been like one sentence, but you can kind of cheat it, you know, don't put a period and, you know, put a couple commas in there, you know, so it's one sentence, but a very long kind of windy sentence. Um, it really just depends, you know, I think the shorter, shorter, the better, but I mean, if you're, if you're at two sentences, you know, it's, it's fine. I mean, like a lot of the, when they list the blacklist scripts and the log lines for those, when they come out every year, I mean, a lot of times those are, sometimes those are like a very short sentence. Sometimes they're two sentences. Um, but I think you just want to, as long as you're under two sentences, you're, you're, you're okay. For me, I just have a, I have, it's really hard to, to get it to even two sentences, you know? Um, so I, I try, I, I try to keep them as short as possible, but I feel like I over explain things and, uh, um, you know, so that's a, that's a challenge for me, but usually two sentences max for, for me. Thank you. Um, the next question we have from an attendee here is, have you had any great screenwriting teachers? Um, yeah, you know, I, uh, when I first moved to, when I first moved to New York, there was this, uh, um, you know, I, I'd just written a couple scripts on my own. And I think in college, I took a couple classes, but they were mo mostly resulted in like short, short film scripts. Um, but I'd never written a feature length script. Um, so I found this, there was this, this guy, he's no longer living, this guy named Irv Bauer, who taught screenwriting at NYU. And I, you know, I took, took like uh one-on-one -on -one classes with him for like a year. And I learned a ton, you know, um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, there are a number of people out there who, who are, are really good. You know, if you're not, if you're not like enrolled at college where they have a program where you can kind of do that, I know like, um, you know, USC, UCLA, um, Columbia in New York, I mean, there are those good programs, but there's a lot of like coaches and teachers. And I think, but I think that the one thing to be mindful of is that, like I said, there's a lot of them and not all of them are, you know, the most legit. So I think the key is just like making sure if you, if you do come across somebody that you vet them and, and just make sure that they're solid and, um, you get some recommendations of people who've worked with them. Um, but Lee Jessup, that person that I was, um, telling you about, she's like more like a, like a screenwriting coach versus like a teacher, but she works with like a ton of people who, who are, um, who do like screenwriting online classes and stuff like that too, that you pay for as part of like a package deal with, I know a lot of people like, like, uh, doing those. Awesome. So another question here, once you have your script written, where do you go? Who do you contact? Yep. So, um, so basically 
once you um you have your script let's say let's if you don't have representation or something um you've written your script you've shared it with people you've rewritten it and rewritten it and you feel like it's in really really great shape um there are a couple avenues you can you can do there's screenwriting screenwriting contests and competitions but i think that you know those come with like a pretty hefty fee and they're, they don't all yield the same kind of like clout that um they may be used to or just as each other i think like the nickel fellowships are still kind of regarded as one of the one of the one of the best ones and then there's a handful of of others um online that are they're really good too and basically you want to enter those contests that the prize is like you know uh you have meetings with managers and agents uh or a consultation with them or like these producers will read your script um that's uh that's uh uh one way uh, a lot of people it, this is uh, there's like different schools of thought on this but you know sending like query letters which is basically like you know every every management company um out there or production company you know they'll they'll a lot of them take unsolicited queries they'll accept them but whether or not they actually get read is like one thing that's basically like, and that's a whole other conversation. The query letter is like where you basically like emailing this person with like, here's your log line, here's what the story's about, here's a little bit about me, uh, and here's why you should read my script. Um, and you're not supposed to attach the script to that, but you're basically like pitching them like a very short pitch. Um, and sometimes people have found representation that way. You know, some I think managers and production companies are like a lot better at actually going through that email inbox and looking for stuff. Um, and sometimes they can just go unanswered, but um, those are two, those are two, um, two ways. And, you know, I've done, I've done, I've done both. I found my manager by, you know, there was a screenwriting contest that I entered um, a long time ago and I, I placed in like the top 20 or something. And part of the prize was you get flown out to LA and you basically do like, you know, speed dating with like various managers and agents, kind of like round robin style. Um, and I met I met my manager at one of those things. And, you know, so those kind of prizes that are attached to concepts, contests, sorry, um, are uh are uh are good and can be can be helpful. Thank you. We have a few connected questions. I'm gonna try and go through them. Let me see here. Yeah. Um, one person asked, what would you title a cold query like that? Um, I think the title and the log line, you know, I mean, the subject could just be what the, the, the title is by so-and-so. Obviously, you're not going to put the log line in the email subject or, you know, it could be, could be a little long. Um, but, but yeah, I think you would want to have the script title and maybe it's like, this meets that, this film meets that film, you know, something that's kind of like going to grab their attention um i think if it's too long they might just delete the email and not not read it another related question to what you were talking about a little bit ago um, when you meet people at industry events what do you say about yourself do you have an elevator pitch about yourself i'm really bad and my wife tells me this all the time i'm just really bad at like like talking about myself and talking about like writing uh, when I'm out in, in public, you know, and like a part of my day job is I'm like, I'm around filmmakers and, um, you know, actors and managers and stuff all the time. But, uh, and I'm not great. I'm not great at like, you know, being like, oh, I'm, uh, I'm also a writer, you know? Um, but, but yeah, I think that if, if it's somebody that I think that like, Hey, this is, this is, uh, if you run into a manager, if you run into a producer and you're like, oh, you know, like I have a script that I know this particular producer, this is like the kind of thing that he does, you know, um, I, th I don't think it's, I don't think it's like bad to kind of like elevator pitch it. But if you're going to do that, I think it's like, I have a script about X meets whatever, you know, and that's where the log line comes in handy because it's your elevator pitch, you know, one to two sentences so that you're not like sitting there um basically like reciting your entire script beat beat by beat and their eyes start to glaze over um but yeah i think it's usually like if you find yourself in a situation where there's somebody that you know likes the kind of scripts that you write and if you can strike up an organic conversation you know 
Um, not immediately like, oh, hey, I have this script about this, you know, but like, oh, I write scripts kind of like this and kind of just feel them out and get a sense of if they're like open to um, to reading something. And if they like are the ones who request to read it, like even better, you know? Thank you. Um, someone else asked, any insights about what made your Nichols winning script so excellent? <laughs> Uh, well, it, it, it placed, uh, it, it placed in like the, the semifinals, which is like pretty hard to get to in the nickels, but no, I was, I had this like sort of unique take on Sherlock Holmes, um, a long time ago. Um, nothing ever really happened with that script, but you know, when you place in the semifinals, a lot of like managers and, and agents reach out requesting to read them. So I made some contacts, uh, that way. Yeah. And af af of the semifinal is after that round, they pick like 10 finalists um, from, from that. So I got pretty close. That's great. Um, we have a few questions here about um, your craft specifically. So firstly, uh, what are some of the best ways that you improve your own craft? Um, so reading, that's the best way. And I think that it's like, it sounds kind of like, easy to keep going back to it but I think just reading scripts like you know if I'm reading the trades or like Hollywood Reporter or Variety whatever and there was like a really cool um idea that came up for a script that just sold um I'll try to like see if I can find that script somehow you know and read it um and I think just like the more you read the more you know like hey I just read this script and it was like really awesome but then you're, you have to kind of deconstruct it and discover like why why was that awesome? You know, like, why did I really like it? What was it about it that I responded to? I just think the more you can read what goes into these, like, to like good scripts, scripts that made it to this list or that were produced or optioned or sold. Um, I think it just helps you um, when you're reading a script that you wrote and you're, you're like, oh, wow, I wonder why I'm getting bored at this part or why that part's not flowing as well as it should, you know, it really kind of helps you get tuned to um, what makes a good script. And then, you know, reading those, reading interviews with, with screenwriters, I think is, is really helpful too. And like stories about how they broke into the industry and what their process is like is, is really helpful. And um, that site script shadow that I was talking about too. Um, and that's like a little bit controversial, maybe not really, but um, they really just break down different facets of, of these scripts that have recently sold or movies that just came out and why they weren't good or why they were good and what worked about them and what didn't. So I think just really breaking those down um, um, is helpful for, uh, for me. All those, all those things. Thank you. Another question about your work. What have you learned about story through your work? Um, what have I learned about story? Um, just, I think it's, it's important to have a, a good one that I think that is this story important? You know what I mean? Is this, is this a, is this a movie that I would want to go see? You know, I mean, I think I, I, all of us probably come up with ideas all the time, but then I think you have to ask yourself, like, is that idea and, and the story of that idea enough to sustain itself? You know, would, it, would this be a movie that I would ultimately want to go see? Um, I think is an important question to ask, you know, because I think there's like a inclination to like, when I first starting out, I was like, I want to write, you know, the next No Country for Old Men or like a really prolific coming of age story, you know, and even if that's something that you like writing, you know, I don't know, is that a movie that I would ultimately want to go see? I don't know, you know? Um, so I think that when you're talking about story, it's just, yeah, is it, is it something that excites you? It's something you feel passionate about. I think just making sure that you're connected to the story and to the characters for me is like how I feel like I, when I write at my best, you know, and I can come up with the, the best characters and good dialogue. Um, Cause I, I've written script where you're just, you're just not connected to the character or the story really, whether it was like my original idea or I was writing an idea that somebody sent to me or something. Um, if you don't, if you're not sort of engaged with the world and the story and the character, then it's not going to feel honest. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, next question here. Can you share about voice? Voice. Huh, that's that's a tough one. And it's like one of those things like hard to kind of like, like, what is it? You know what I mean? And it's like, you can like write. I think it's just like what it is. It's just It's like what makes you unique as a writer. You know, like it could be like who you are, where you came from, your, you know, your upbringing, whatever. Um, but also like how you tell the story, you know, like there are like very like voicey kind of scripts out there where like, you know, the prose is all like, you know, a lot of like breaking the fourth wall, kind of talking to the reader, you know, kind of, kind of stuff, like a little in your face. Um, and, you know, but there's people who like do some really interesting things, you know what I mean? But I think a lot of it too is like, what, what does the dialogue sound like? Is it authentic? And is it different from um, other scripts I've read? Is it unique to like a certain world? But I think a lot of that just comes from like a writer's experience and, um, you know, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Cause I think that like, I personally think I, I, I don't really know if I, I have a voice, you know, or like how I would even really describe that. You know, I think I write sort of kind of like a straightforward and, and I don't really like write for the reader or talk to the, whoever's reading your script, but I've read a lot of scripts that are just like totally in your face. Like, I think like Shane, Shane Black, um, you know, who wrote the Lethal Weapon movies and a bunch of other movies. Um, uh, if you read one of his scripts, you, you'll kind of get a sense of like, oh, okay. Yeah. This guy is like, you know, writing on like, uh, on speed or something, you know? Um, but, but yeah. Thanks, George. And the next question here, what made your take on Sherlock Holmes so unique? Hmm. Uh, so I, um, it was basically about um, uh, this teenager who, who um, you know, he came from like, you know, a, a poor neighborhood in, in New York City. And it was about, um, I don't know if you've if you guys have seen The Wire, that that show on HBO from from way back way back when. Um, it was kind of like basically the easiest way to describe it is like The Wire meets Sherlock Holmes, where a lot of it's happening in like New York and like urban environments and um, you know cops and teenagers and stuff like that. So it's kind of like a modern day take on it. But you know there've been a million different takes on Sherlock Holmes, like probably too many. So nothing really ultimately happened with it. Alex mentioned that she thought it could be a great TV show. So maybe one day, George. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe, maybe one day. We'll see. You know, and that's another thing too. I mean, for people to remember, like if you wrote a really good script that a lot of people liked and let's say it got traction in a contest or with a manager, with an agent or with a producer, but nothing ultimately didn't sell and nothing ultimately happened with it. Ultimately those, you don't feel too broken up about it because then, you know, you, it, it can be a really great writing sample. I think I've written so many scripts that I was like, oh, this is the one, this is the one that's going to sell, you know, and uh, it doesn't happen, you know, but you end up with like really solid writing samples that a lot of people, you know, in the industry have helped you craft and get to a point where they were comfortable sending it out. So you never know. Um, people request older scripts all the time, you know? So it could have a second life or a third life. That's great to keep in mind. Yeah. Another attendee asked, what would you say an average price is for a screenplay? And they commented that they've already had a producer approach them. Mm. The purchase price? Um, God, I don't know. I mean, I think that I think it depends, you know, there's like, I think if you're working with like a studio, um, if like, if, if like a Netflix or something buys it or a streamer or, you know, a bigger studio like Warner brothers or universal or something, then you're probably going to get more money for it versus like if an independent producer is buying it or a smaller distributor, I think it just, I think it just, um, I think it just, it just depends, you know, there's like minimums too. I think it depends on if you're on the WGA or if you're not in the WGA, if you're not in the WGA, they don't have to pay you as much. 
but if you are, it's pay you more. Um, yeah. Alex, sorry, were you? I saw you. You typed something, and I couldn't see the rest of the. Yes, yeah, she oh. asked if it makes a difference if commissioned. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I you know, I'm not in the WGA, but I've been hired by like an independent production company to like basically write a script based on an original concept that they had and you know because i'm not in the wga it was it was under under ten thousand dollars and that's like three drafts that you're committed to have to write um plus blah 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 um but but yeah i mean like if you're if you write a big splashy you know original feature script and like netflix buys it i mean i you know i've heard that um you know those I don't think people are paying like a million dollars anymore, but it could be like, you know, um, six figures. I think it just depends on like if there's a bidding war, you know, or, or what. Great. Next question here. Can you share more about writing emotional moments? Like if you have a great character, how do you make sure the storyline is interesting and emotional and not boring? Um, so, um, one thing, I guess I really didn't talk about this before, but if you, if you kind of follow this, like save the cat method, and this will just kind of, this is, this is helpful too. Like if you saw a movie, how am I going to, I'm going to describe this. There's like, um, Sorry, not that you stumped me with the question. I'm just trying to like find uh, where I'm going to go with this. I think it's like if you, let's say you want to write a movie like this exactly like, let's, let's say you want to write Steel Magnolias or something, something that's like very like emotional and sad and whatever. Um, it's helpful to kind of like find a lot of like similar movies to that and like, read those screenplays and find out like what worked about them. Like, why did you feel a certain way at this one moment? I think the more you can kind of like deconstruct um, what made a particular scene work or what made a particular line of dialogue work, you can use that to like, you know, you can use that in your own script. Um, I think, um, yeah, but it, it's just like, the, but it all, it all, I know it's, I keep going back to it, but it's just all, it really all starts on like, character starts with character you know and if if you can come up with a well well-rounded character that people like and root for the dialogue is going to come be, just be more honest in those moments that you want to resonate and, and land in a certain way whether it's funny or like sad or um, poignant whatever um uh it's just gonna be more more honest Thank you. We had a couple of questions like that in the question and answer box there. So I've marked them all as answered then. So thanks everyone. Um, and then we have another question here. How do you approach thinking about a script so that you actually give good feedback? How do you approach, how do you approach? Thinking about a script so that you actually give good feedback. And if whoever asked that wants to ask an additional follow-up question, uh -oh. feel free to include that now. Yeah, I think it's important to find out what the if whoever script you're going to be reading and giving feedback on. I think it's important to maybe have a sense of what the writer's intent was. Like, what do they want this to be? If they're like, hey, like, I wrote this really great script that's basically like John Wick, you know, on a spaceship or something. I don't know. That's terrible. But like, and you're like, oh, man, that sounds awesome. I want to read that. And if you read it uh, and it's it, and it's like not that at all, you know um then i think that's that's telling you something i think that's important too so i think just getting a sense of what the writer's intent is like what they set out to accomplish and then you know your job then as a reader reading it you have to kind of like grade them on that and check them on that and you know um tell them if they were like not hitting the mark or if this is like totally left field script and not at all like the concept you described um could be helpful i think Thanks, George. 
Um, someone has asked, what is the difference between screenplay and stage play in writing? Mm. Um, you know, I, I think a stage, I don't know what a stage play is. I think a stage play is like a, like a, like a play play, like a, like a, if you're going to go see a play at a theater or in a theater, um, I've never written a stage play. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure. Stephanie, think, do you have any? I think it might be theater specific. Well, I wonder if, sorry to interject, but Stephanie, do you have any input based on the one act plays that, that you've vetted for our big read programming in terms of how they might be different? I think mostly like how George mentioned, the setting is different. Um, and then they have the stage directions included as well. Yeah. Um, I would say that's the primary one um, and any dialogue and but I think that there are a lot of similarities as well, um, but the difference would just be that setting in the theater and on a, you know, on a stage um, and having the directions, I think. Oh, well, then sorry, everybody. I guess I have written a stage play. I have done a couple of the one, the, the, uh, the couple of the big read one acts. So that's the difference. Exactly what Stephanie said. I had forgotten that for the record. I was not trying to trip you up. <laughs> I had forgotten you'd contributed. Was, that your, was it your question? It was. It was just me. Alex. I'm sorry. <laughs> Man, it's messed up. Um, no, but a script, yeah, it's like you've all probably seen the screenplay. It looks very technical. And I think a lot of people who don't read scripts. I think when they read, you know, they're used to just reading books or whatever. When you read a script, sometimes it can be a little bit like, oh, this is like, seems very technical, you know? Um, so your job is to make it not as technical, make it fun. Thanks, George. And we have one more question in the Q&A here. So if anyone has any final questions before we wrap up, go ahead and submit those now. Um, this question says, what should you look for when you're looking for an entertainment lawyer? Um, hmm. You know, I mean, somebody who's going to be help, who is going to be able to help you negotiate deals. Um, for me, I've, I've not worked with one before, but when I started working with um, my first manager a bunch of years ago, <laughs> a script, the first script I wrote with, with him um, that he was going to take out he wanted to bring on, um, there, it was starting to get some interest in potential producers. So he was like wanting to bring on a, an entertainment lawyer at that point, just to kind of help negotiate the deals. I think every manager is different, but I, and so I haven't worked with one, so I really can't, can't tell you top to bottom, but I'm pretty sure they are the ones to help, um, to help negotiate, go through contracts. If there's a contract to be signed, make sure you're not going to get screwed over, that your best interests are, you know, being taken into account. Um, you're being looked out for. Um, yeah. But was the question how to seek one, how to seek one out or, or what the role is? Sorry. It was just um, what you should look for when you're looking for an entertainment lawyer. What so. you should look for. Uh, sorry. Somebody, I think just, like contests or like managers and agents, somebody who's reputable, you know, what you don't want to do is find somebody that you have to pay, you know, in order to like, um, you know, work, work with them. That's like a huge red flag. If you find a, a, a manager or an agent or, uh, you know, an entertainment lawyer, if they're like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll work with you, but you got to pay me 5,000 bucks. And that's obviously no, but if you're going, if you're talking to somebody reputable, like any of the big agencies, the big kind of known management companies, or even the entertainment lawyers, um, the managers and agents earn their commission. If they sell your script, they get like 5% or a certain percentage of the sale price, but entertainment lawyers, I think maybe it works the same for them, but I'm not hundred percent um, sure. Thanks, George. And since I asked, we now have three more questions. These will be the final questions then of the right. program. Yeah, um, two yeah. of them. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions. So thank you, everyone. It's been great. Um, two questions here that are kind of connected. So firstly, mm -hmm. why do you think Back to the Future worked besides following the structure you mentioned? And then someone else asked, why do you think Harry Potter worked? 
Well, I think Back to the Future, I mean, it's just a good movie. No, but why? I think that if you go back, if you go back and read the script, it's a lot of like, it's just very airtight. There's not a lot of wasted scenes or words or pages. They're able to like, you know, the writers, the writer was the makers was able to like, like convey, um, you know, a lot of exposition um, in a pretty seamless way. Like that first opening scene where it's just clocks, you know, like a million clocks and it's Doc Brown's like house or office or whatever, or his garage. And, you know, and then it kind of pans to his little contraptions and it perfectly just sets up who that guy is and who the character is. And you don't even meet him in that scene, you know? So I think just coming up with really creative ways to like get across exposition where you're not just like having characters do it. Cause that's kind of a big no, no where your character is like, Basically, you know, there's like block big chunks of dialogue where it's just exposition um, telling him what you're going to do versus like showing um, showing them visually, you know, with your with your prose and uh, your in your words. Um, so I think it's just like, you know, and I think even just going back to the kernel of the idea, you know, where it's like, what if you could go back in time and you know if you're not happy with your current situation what if you go back in time and change the past to fix your your futures i think it's an idea that just resonates so i think everybody and it's like wish fulfillment I'm sure everybody at some point in their lives is is wish they could do that you know um, um maybe not inadvertently make your family disappear but um but yeah so i feel like it's 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 a kind of a universal um thing you know and obviously Michael J. Fox is awesome. Christopher Lloyd is is awesome, but you know, they were written as great, great characters, you know. So I think that's where it it uh started. Thanks, George. Uh, and, and, uh, what was, what? Sorry, the, and, it was why do you Harry think Potter? Harry Potter worked? Yeah. No. Um Harry Potter is kind of I guess it's kind of different. Um, because you know, you have like is it 12 books? Sorry, I'm not a huge Harry Potter guy, but um, it started off as like these, these books that were kind of a phenomenon, you know, and you were able to go into such detail uh, in those books to create the worlds and the characters. And then I think, um, you know, adapting those to the screen, um, you, you already had like the fan base there, you know, I think for the most part, the movies were pretty, were pretty good. Um, but yeah, um, I don't know. The thing I didn't like about Harry Potter was it just felt like, you know, the ending of every single one was like the same ending, you know, he'd encounter that bad guy, Voldemort, they'd fight and then they'd go their own ways. And that would happen like with all the movies. But um, I think it worked because it just captured children's imaginations. You know, if there was like this cool wizard school that you could go to and um, who wouldn't want to do that? You know, I think most people would probably rather go there than, um their own schools thanks george yes i'd agree the harry potter fan base is intense <laughs> i was part of that when i was younger <laughs> oh, yeah <laughs> nice well, alex can attest to her, her her daughter's going one of her daughters is going going through the harry potter books yes so awesome all right, and so here's the final question then. Um, have you come up with any methods to help with coming up with new story ideas quickly? So you could write four scripts in a year versus only one per year, for example. Oh my God, man, I, you know, I, I had like lofty goals for myself the year before last where I was gonna like, you know, I have a day job and I have a family. And so like, uh, you know, writing one script a year is realistic for me, but I was like, I'm gonna do two. Um, but I think the easiest way to just generate ideas and just bang out a bunch of log lines, you know, that I think are good. And I think a good way to craft a log line is to sort of, if you have an idea, right? Or if you, even if you take like, if you take like, um, it feels like every movie has been made basically, right? So coming up with original ideas is pretty tough. But if you take like concepts and log lines from like, very like mainstream popular films and can kind of find a way to turn those ideas on their head a little bit. Like, you know, what, what movie? I mean, this is, this is like a late, this is like a 
uh, kind of a, a lazy way to do it. But if there's like, um, if it's like Sherlock Holmes, right? And there's Holmes and Watson, and it usually takes place in the past. But if you found a way to like tra transport that story to like space or something, you're kind of putting a fresh spin on a on a kind of a tired um, concept. But you know that um, the concept was popular because like a lot of people might have seen that movie. But how do you kind of put a fresh spin on it? Like like um, Pride and Prejudice, or you know, remember like like uh, however many years ago, like there was that fad where like people basically put like zombies in there in the main is the main characters you know like pride and prejudice and zombies it's like oh suddenly that was like everybody's doing that you know it's like taking these like sort of like ideas that are already exist and were either a famous book or a famous movie and finding unique ways to kind of like turn that um on its head um could be cool like you know Fast and the Furious are like super popular movies, right? But there's if there's a way you can kind of like turn that idea on its head where like, I don't know, instead of like humans, it's like vampires or something, you know? I don't know. It's like vampires who pull off heists. It's kind of a cool, but like in really cool cars. But it's that idea that people have seen that they they know exactly what that movie is. And they know exactly like, you know, how to visualize it. Yeah. But so I think they're like coming up with like sort of like taking those like popular log lines and ideas and putting a fresh spin is a quick way to generate new um, ideas. But I wouldn't, but like going back to what you, the part of the question too was so you can write like more than one script a year. I just, I think that like, I would rather, I think it's better to like spend your time writing one really good script than trying to to meet some kind of quota and do two a year or three or four because if you're like rushing it um then it's not gonna just to meet a certain like script count or something it's not gonna it's not gonna be the best that it it can be you know so i would just you know focus on like one idea at a time give it all the time it needs um but like if you have two awesome ideas that are basically like ready to start writing and turning into a script maybe write like you know maybe write the first act at one and then you kind of get, you're sort of like stuck and, you know, don't know how you're going to hit this particular beat rather than just like wait three or four days um, to think of how you're going to get through that part. Um, put it down and start writing your second idea, you know, um, and kind of toggle it like that. I've not done that, but um, I'm kind of more just like a one idea, one script at a time kind of, kind of person. Thank you so much, George. We do have, there's one more question if you're opening to sure. answer one more. Yeah. All right. So this will be the last, last one. So no what's problem. the difference between a studio production company and producer? I'm a little unclear about who I should reach out to when I'm querying. Yeah. So you won't really reach out to the studio. So like the studio is basically like, like, you know, Warner Brothers or Universal, um, Disney, you know, and those are like the studios that they, they'll buy movies. They might buy a script. They might, they, but they, they usually like, you know, um, will will hire writers that they know to develop concepts that they might've had internally or that's based on their existing IP, but then the studios release movies. Like they're the ones who are putting them in theaters or putting them on Disney plus kind of thing. The production company, the producer is the one that usually finds the script and will bring it to a studio. Um, like I said, whether they're, they might have like a, five picture deal with um this producer might have a five picture deal with warner brothers or something like that um and uh yeah the producers like sometimes it's just an independent producer who doesn't have a production company they're just their own person um so sometimes the like that independent producer will you know team up with a producer at another production company i mean that's happened before too you know and that particular producer might be better at genre than the other producer is. So it's it's tricky, but I think if you're approaching people, you're usually approaching managers because um, you know they're the ones who um, um, who will get people to pay attention. Because like if you're just kind of sending a script idea to like a producer cold um, or, or whatever, they're not going to really read it. You know, they kind of need to be, a writer kind of needs to be vetted. And I think having, uh, you know, a manager or representation is helpful because that, 
if, if they're sending it to a producer, that producer is more likely to read it. Well, thank you so much, George. Really appreciate your time. That's been a lot of amazing insight from someone here. I have no experience with screenwriting and I'm very intrigued now and want to learn more. So thank you very much. Um, thank Anything you to everyone thanks. who's attended this evening as well. Um, we will be sharing the recording in the coming week or so with everyone, along with the outline that I put in the chat from George. Um, so I'll be emailing that out, and Alex is screen sharing that now. Thank you, Alex. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions, feel free to email those to me when you get the email from Eventbrite. Um, it'll be a museum staff member who has the reply to email, and they'll get it to me. Um, and we can answer your questions via follow-up ones. But thank you all so much. Um, the Big Read does run through April 30th here in Maslin. Since you're on an online program, um, if you're free the next two Thursdays, we have additional online programs happening. We have an artist panel with artists from Finding Identity, Heritage's Inspiration next Thursday via the museum's Facebook Live, and that will be uploaded later to YouTube, as well as the keynote with author Charles Yu, who is, of course, also a screenwriter. Um, he is going to be um, presenting also on Facebook Live. So follow us on Maslin Museum um, on facebook.com and check us out. Um, you can also follow us on other social media and visit massmu.org slash bigread to learn more about all the other awesome programs we have going on this month, um, both here at the Maslin Museum and throughout the community. So thank you again, George, and thank you everyone for attending. Yeah. We hope you have a wonderful evening. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everybody. Hopefully uh, I didn't bore you. Bye.